Hello everyone, I've got another exciting project for you again. Uh, this one really didn't start as a sculpting project, but more as a way to take a break from sculpting. I made this in October 2021 and I had just finished my Monster Bash entry. I had to sculpt, paint and edit a video in one month, which for me was quite a lot. And on top of that, I also decided to join Inktober for that year and I remember feeling like I took on a bit more than I could handle. Both of these projects required a lot of structure and planning, so I really wanted to make something now without any plans uh, to liberate my mind. At the time I still had a workshop and I remember coming there the 1st of November and I saw my woodworking tools and I thought, I know what I want to make, a wooden box. I love making wooden boxes, uh, like this one for, that I made for my uh, tentacle roller. Um, another one I have is uh, this one. Uh, this one holds magic item cards that I use uh, in Dungeons and Dragons. I also really like this one. Uh, it's a dice tray that can hold my Dungeons and Dragons books. Um, Unfortunately, I made it a little bit too small, so getting them out again is a bit of a, a hassle. Anyway, back to the video. Since I wanted something unplanned, I just started making the box without taking any measurements. I took a piece of wood that spoke to me and just started. A lot of the wood I use comes from discarded furniture and this piece of oak is one of them. I think I found it on the street somewhere and while I was working on it, I really liked the dirty pattern I had so I decided to not send it down. A quick tip for all of you who want to start making boxes as well, and that really helped me in my journey, is to glue your box completely together with the bottom and the lid in place, and then to cut it open again. I'm not sure how many people will actually start making boxes after watching this video, but even if it is only one, it is worth sharing. Also, it was an elaborate excuse to include this. This box in half. After adding some hinges, I was left with a nice little box. I then started watching some of the other entries of that year's Monster Bash, and I was immediately hit with inspiration when I saw Trent's massive dragon in a box and Terran's amazingly creepy pumpkin monster also in a box. So it was clear I was going to make a little diorama inside this box, but I struggled with what exactly I should put inside because there wasn't a lot of space. If only I could make it bigger, I thought to myself. I really needed some more depth. Something to give me some perspective on how to continue. False perspective was the answer. I didn't have a lot of space in the box, but I could make it look like there was more space. I realized that this is easier said than done, so I'm going to try to explain how I did this. At this point I also decided to make a castle hallway because I felt like a building of sorts would be easier to create this type of effect for than a more natural environment. First I sketched out the front view of the box and I cut a piece of thin foam the size of the back wall. I glued this piece inside the box and with it in place I could take all the measurements I needed to cut the panels that would be warped by the false perspective. The distance between the two vertical edges the top horizontal edge, the lower horizontal edge, and the vertical difference in height between the front and the back. With the same thin sheets of foam, I used these measurements to cut out the first panel. Test fitting it in place, I could already see the perspective effect doing its magic. Continuing like this, I created the rough shape of the hallway. First, I thought to make a door in the center in the back, but I decided to make the hallway go around the corner to further strengthen the sense of depth. I then drew a lot of guidelines on the foam to help me with sculpting in this warped perspective. These lines were also really helpful to create the arches for the groin vault. I did not know it was called like that, but all right. Cutting these arches, it was really clear how warped this hallway actually was. I glued the arches in place with PVA glue, 
I couldn't use super glue because it reacted with the foam and in hindsight I think the longer drying time gave me a little bit more time to make sure everything was aligned well. I filled in the spaces between the archways with air drying clay, knowing that I would go over them later with epoxy clay to sculpt the bricks. When the air drying clay was dry, I sculpted the archways and the columns with milliput. I really wish I could have done this in polymer clay because I feel like I could have made these architectural pieces better if I would have had more time to sculpt them. I wasn't going to experiment with putting foam in the oven though, that seemed like a really bad idea. I realized at this point I needed some more guidelines to sculpt all of the bricks and also for the window in the background. After that I started the tedious process of sculpting thousands of bricks. I was using epoxy sculpt here, but I mostly use it to make it visually distinct from all of the other parts. Also I started on the back wall so that as I continued I minimized the risk of damaging previous parts. I sculpted the rest of the bricks in sections so that I could use the guidelines. The horizontal lines helped in making sure the warped effect would look as convincing as possible, with each row getting slightly larger the closer it gets to the viewer. The vertical lines helped in making each brick slightly wider the closer they are to the viewer. Here you see the warped effect at work. I was surprised that it was quite convincing even in this stage of sculpting. Anyway, I continued all the brickwork on the other walls, the floor, and after what felt like an eternity, the ceiling. I switched to green stuff for the ceiling because the epoxy sculpt wouldn't stick to the air dried clay. With all the sculpting for the hallway practically finished, I started working on the figure I was going to sculpt to put inside of it. I chose to make a vampire and thought it would be amazing if he would be holding a lantern. Um, Actually, the monster manual clearly states that vampires have dark vision up to 120 feet, so they don't need a lantern. Hmm. Yes, vampires have dark vision. I didn't realize that until I was already... I took a fake LED candle, desoldered the LED and soldered some wire in place to be able to wire the LED through the sculpt. Using some green stuff, thin brass wire and super glue, I attached the wires onto the armature. I sculpted the vampire almost entirely with milliput because I just wanted to see how it handles for a full miniature. There are a lot of sculptors and they all seem to have their preferences. Green stuff, mini putt, sculpy, beast putty, magic sculpt, epoxy sculpt, a mix of green stuff and mini putt, and I'm sure I missed many more. It's easy to get lost in all of the pros and cons you can find online, so I decided to get some hands on experience. One thing I noticed is that it is very easy to create crisp lines with mini putt. It is a little bit crumbly, but if you lubricate your tools a little bit, you can prevent it from tearing. Making the seam in the vest here wouldn't have been uh, easy in pure green stuff, for example. Another part where this comes in very useful is when you sculpt details, like this belt buckle. If I were to use green stuff for this, it would be more likely to deform when I try to push in small details like this. Something else that is very practical is that Milliput can be sanded and filed to create sharp and geometrical objects. I would never be able to sculpt a sword this straight without sanding it. Sculpting the cloak is something I knew I was not going to try with Milliput. Trying to sculpt something as thin and stretched out as a cloak would tear the Milliput immediately. Green stuff, on the other hand, can be stretched very thin before it starts to tear. I tried to sculpt the head and the hair with milliput as well, but I could not get it right. The coarser texture really wasn't working in my favor, so I mixed in some green stuff 
to give the clay a little bit more flexibility. After a quick primer, I use my airbrush to establish some contrast in the hallway. I wanted it to look like there was moonlight coming from the window, so I painted it and the surrounding floor white. I followed with an overall glaze of dark blue. I continued with a dark blue wash over all of the stonework. After that, I did a little bit of dry brushing and that was enough for me. For some reason, I can be incredibly patient sculpting all of the bricks, but I cannot be bothered to individually highlight them during painting. Mr. Fanbuyer was next, and I gave him some glazes on top of the black and white airbrushing I did earlier. I think this was the first time using a black and white undercoat like this, and I kind of enjoyed it. It is relatively easy work for a good looking base coat. The face I really struggled with. On the one hand I wanted the face to look pale and white, but at the same time I wanted dark shadows and warm directional lighting from the lantern. I didn't really know how to achieve this and I feel like the final result kind of shows. I would love to hear if anyone has advice or ideas, if you do, please share them in the comments. Personally I loved how it looked when I was painting him with a pale complexion, but I later applied a warm wash over it and I do not like how it looks. With the painting done, I ran the wires through the floor towards the back of the box and gave Mr. Vampire some boots. For a while I was hesitating what to add in the empty space inside the lid. I thought it, I could paint a family crest or write some scary text, but in the end I decided that another castle wall would be best in my opinion. I sketched out the design and sculpted some more bricks. After a similar treatment as the rest of the brickwork, I thought I could try a little freehand painting inside the window. It was practically begging for a tiny little landscape. After a blue to black gradient, I sketched out the moon and some clouds. Later, I added a couple of trees with black. And finally, I dotted in some stars and I used the tiniest bit of yellow paint on the moon to add just a little bit of color. And that's it for this video. I really hope you liked it. If you did, you can leave a like down below. Uh, you can subscribe if you want to see more of these kind of things. And here are some close-up shots for you to enjoy. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time.